What's going on, people? Welcome back to another John Sinclair TV this evening. I've got the legend, of, and he's a South American football expert, Tim Vickery. Hi, Tim. In the words of the former US President Jimmy Carter, away the lads. <laughs> love it. Love it. Get a black and white top on you, Tim. <laughs> so, well, thank you for coming on, Tim, and I uh, appreciate that. And guys, if you like the video, like what you watch, make sure you hit the like button, also hit the subscribe button, please. And if you like to become a member, it's just 99p. And Super Chats are open as well. Let's go straight to the questions as well. And um, first question I going to ask you, Tim, is we all know you're the first South American football. How did you get from Hemel Hempstead to Rio? <laughs> and I'm also a richer fear technology in Brazil's Favelas, which I believe means slums or ghettos, to become known as Legendinho or Wikipedia due to your fast knowledge of Brazilian and South American football generally. Yeah, I, I think there's some, something went wrong in, in Wikipedia with that one because the, yeah. the, story's, the story's not quite right. Um, but I'm very proud of it anyway. You know, council state kid from Hamel Hempstead. The old man never got further than a weekend in Dublin, and 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 here I am. Um, I was uh, uh, I did history and politics in college. Left college, and I formed a magazine with a few mates, and we went up. It was mainly a comedy magazine, and we went up and down the country. We wrote it, we laid it up, we went around the country, mainly in students, kind of student unions, trying to sell it. And we went bust pre pretty quickly, so I had no idea what I was going to do. I ended up, just purely by chance, working in a theatre in the West End of London. I had no connection with theatre whatsoever, but it was an old college mate who said, you know, we need someone part-time. And, and so I went there and I needed a job and I ended up staying for years and, and, and running the place. And it was like a second college because heart of London, there's yeah. people there from all over the world. And we had a bar downstairs where we had these fantastic parties, all-night parties. Uh, and it was full of Brazilians. So I discovered Brazil. And mm -hmm. I thought, this is interesting. Uh, and I was looking for something else to do. And I, was, I wanted the experience of living abroad. And I thought, if it doesn't happen now, it's probably not going to happen. I was 29 at the time. And I think that's, that, that's a good age. You know, you're kind of old enough to have a little bit of maturity to deal with, with the slings and arrows that life's going to throw at you. But you're also, you're young enough. So if it doesn't work, you can come back home and start and start something else. So I came over here when I, when I was 29, which is yeah. half a life ago now. And uh, I had no idea how it was going to pan out. I've never planned anything. It's all just happened. Um, but on the way, you kind of pick up a client here and you pick up a client there and, and, you end up falling in love and, and, and marrying and staying, you know, and uh, and and here I still am, you know, all, all, all this time later. I haven't found the I haven't found the way out yet. But no, it's been brilliant. It's 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 been fabulous. And uh, the lesson for me there is go on and try it, do it, especially while you're young, you know, especially while you can fail. Because you get to mine, you get a family, you can't fail no more. You can't fail, you know. But before you before you get the family and the kids and so on, when you got the chance to take some risks, take some risks. Well, I have to agree with that, Tim. I wish I was young now, but I tell you what, I mean, never done Brazil, and it looks a fantastic country as well. Lovely beaches, real a lovely city as well. Yeah, on it, it, there, there's a downside to it, and it's uh, it, it's not safe. Really, isn't you know, in big city Brazil is is violent and that that has an effect that limits people and it it messes people up as well growing up in 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 in, in, in those kind of situations so there's a downside to it the older i get the more i think i really don't want to be here when i'm when i'm really old too i'll, I'll feel too vulnerable when i'm when i'm really old but it's been very good to me and i'm very grateful to it and uh certainly i imagine i'll be here for for the next decade Wow, good on you too. Good on you. And I tell you what, though, I'll be wish you a few success in Brazil. Okay. Okay. Um, and the next question I'd like to ask you as well: How has your journalist career evolved? How's your career evolved through being in the right place at the right time, and through extraordinary luck? And I always think to to succeed in life, you need the three things to fire together. You need a little bit of talent. You need a lot of hard work. Yeah. But talent and hard work without a bit of luck, they don't get you that far. You need some luck along the way. And I turned out to be in the right place at the right time, I think, because when I moved out, I moved out here just after the, the, the World Cup in 94. Mm -hmm. And that World Cup, 
it was like all the World Cups before that. If you were an England, an England living in England, you didn't know the Brazil team until the World Cup. That was one of the great things about the World Cup. You discovered the players during the course of the competition. And then uh, by 1998, it had all changed. And a big reason for that is Nike, because Nike had got involved. First of all, they tried with basketball. And then they saw that football was a global game. And they did their homework and they realized that Brazil, especially even more then than now, was everyone's favorite second team. So they signed up Brazil. And they started pumping out the adverts, pumping out the adverts. So by the 1998 World Cup, the average English supporter, he knew most of the Brazil team before the tournament. I don't know if you're old enough to remember, John, but the, uh, the advert that took place in the airport lounge, it was brilliant, fantastic advert. And so suddenly there was more interest in the Brazil national team. And I was here to, to, to do it. So that, that, that was an incredible piece of luck that, 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 got, that, that got me in. And then I got into World Soccer magazine uh, yeah. in 97. As a result of, 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 of that, soon afterwards, I did a, um, there was a TV documentary being made with Gary Lineker. He was going around the world interviewing uh, previous top goal scorers in World Cups. So they were doing one in Brazil and uh, they needed someone to help them speak Portuguese and talk to the people and fix that up. So I got in that and that went well. And on the back of that, I got into the BBC. So 97 was the year that suddenly all the doors opened for me. And if it hadn't happened, I would have had to come home because I wouldn't have been able to have a visa to stay. So everything happening in 1997 was, again, another piece of luck because it was either that or go home. Uh, so and, and ever since then, no, I'm still in world soccer. I'm still with the BBC. Other clients have come and gone. One of the things that makes me happiest is I work in Portuguese as well. I do a TV show. Usually I do it twice a week. So that's two and a half hours twice a week. I write a column every week for for a Brazilian site as well. But clients come and clients go. Uh, and uh, thankfully, there have always been enough of them to pay the bills. You know, you add it all up and, and, and you pay the bills. So nothing is, I've never ever planned. It's always been, oh yeah, what are we going to do today? What, 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 what does a client ask me to do today? I've, I've never planned it. In, in, a lot, in a lot of ways, it, it's really kind of amateur, really, the way I go, I, I go about things. And I don't have, like you, I don't have a YouTube channel or, or anything mm -hmm. like that. I don't really understand the way that the modern world works. I, I don't really understand credit cards. I like cash. You know what I mean? You know, yeah, we all do. <laughs> yeah, I'm really old school. You know? yeah. <laughs> so the, the modern world just leaves me leaves me baffled. It's one of the great things about having stepdaughters, that I don't understand anything. How do I do this? How do I work this app? And one of them has to come and, 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 and help me out. So uh, no, I think things have, have – I keep thinking – this can't go on forever. This can't go on forever. You know, <laughs> one, know. Of days, one of these days it's all going to dry up, but it hasn't done yet. And, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm far closer to the end now than I, than I am to the beginning. So no, I've had a, I've had a fantastic, a fantastic uh, run. So it's been, a, I think a little bit of talent, plenty of hard work, mm -hmm. but the luck at the vital times, you try it without the luck and it's not going to happen. Absolutely. Everything you said there, Tim, I totally agree. I mean, look, it's tough li living abroad and um, you've got to make it there. And in your case, you absolutely made it all the way. So credit to you yeah, on that I, as well, I, man. I went, when I first came over, I went hungry. Uh, and that was that was scary. To go to go hungry a long, long way away from home, that, it, that's, that, that really, and that, that, that has given me a work ethic, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then soon after I got myself out of that position, Suddenly, I found myself responsible for a family with a uh, a, a wife and, and two small kids, as as they were then. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's it's been it's very very different from the life I used to leave in London. Used to lead in London, which was uh, wonderfully irresponsible. You know, it's great. I loved it. I loved all those times being being young, free, and looking for a tingle in London. It was brilliant. But you know, responsibility finds you one way or the other, and when it finds you, you've uh, you've you've got to live <laughs> up to it. Thankfully, in my case, I've been able to meet those responsibilities doing something that I really enjoy doing, that I love doing. So I realise how lucky I am. But there's been a lot of hard work that's gone into it. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, next question I've got to ask you, Tim, as well. I mean, you touched on it as well. What are your thoughts on the growth of social media 
and its impact on journalism. There's just too many in the news these days, and people's just making up transfer rumors, yeah, yeah. and you know, people fall for it every time. I mean, there's not a lot we can do about it. We can't stop them from making it up, do you know what I mean? But you either ignore it or you believe it. Yeah, you, you've got to sift through, haven't you? you you've, you've got. To, I'm, I'm very happy that I grew up in a world without social media. Yeah. So, you know, for me, it's an extra. I can live without it, no problem. And so for me, it's something that, that can add to me. Like, I, I think Twitter is great for finding out things, but you okay. do have to sift through. But I feel sorry for those younger who are growing up where it's natural because um, – I think it's worrying. I mean, there are things about it that, that worry me. I mean, one of the things I always try to do is don't compare yourself with anyone else. Compare yourself with yourself yesterday. Yeah. You know, try and be you better. Don't try and compare yourself with other people. And one of the problems I think for young people growing up with social media is with Instagram or something like that, they're comparing themselves with everyone now. And obviously that makes you feel, if you're comparing yourself with everyone, you're probably not the best. You know? mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I do I do worry about the effect that, that this has. I worry about the effect it has on journalism as well, because and I see this very clearly in, in, in Brazil. Uh, quite a lot of what happens in, in sports, in, in football journalism, is people trying to say what the social media audience want to hear. Exactly. I, think that's, I think that's terrible. I think that, that that's really bad really bad journalism um if you've got something to say uh, for, I, th I think people in our position we should always remember the insignificance of our opinion it's it's an opinion but mm -hmm. on the other hand we should have our opinion and don't be afraid for that opinion to be unpopular yeah i have to agree with you man i mean what you said there tim you're absolutely right i'm learning all the time from you like you know because you know you know your stuff as well um the next question i'm going to ask you is in terms of transfers it seemed the only club in england who recruit directly from south america is brighton for example Castillo, our newcastle and this is a trick here well there are more clubs starting to do it now and Chelsea have brought in two Brazilians in this window straight from Brazil yeah. Nottingham Forest did it a fair bit uh last season as well so it, it's happening more now um what what the the English clubs used to do because you, you you never know if they're going to adapt and in yeah. and in the past Newcastle have brought some in straight from from South America I remember um the Paraguayan Gavilan came in from uh uh uh, Clarence Acuna came in from Chile and in neither of those worked. It didn't work. One, one or two came in from Argentina as well and didn't really work. So there's always a risk because if, you, if you're buying them in from South America, you don't know if they're going to adapt on the field and off the field. So what, what the English clubs have tended to do historically is wait until they go to Portugal or somewhere, have a look at them there. And then if they do well, then buy them in. But if you're going to do that, you've got to pay a lot more. You know, that, that's the way that Portugal makes really? money. You know, Portugal will buy cheap from South America, fatten the calf, and then sell it, and then, then sell it to England. So if you if you go direct to the source to South America, and get it right, you've saved yourself a lot of money. I mean, look at the money that Brighton are making now. Mm. They bought in McAllister, sold him for a fortune. They bought yeah. in Caicedo for five million. They want a hundred million for from him now, but it is it is a risk, uh, and I think Newcastle. Maybe things will change, and obviously you'll know this far better than than I do. Mm -hmm. But Newcastle, they've looked to bring in solid types, no dickheads. I like that financial <laughs> policy. No, no dickheads. I agree. So yeah, they want to bring in the tried and trust. They want to bring in people who know they're going to do going to do a job for them. Now you've got yourself up to a different level and maybe now you can be more expansive and take some risks. But obviously the way that Newcastle have, have been working so far under Eddie Howe has clearly been working very well. Yes, indeed. We've got Dan Ashworth now. He's our director now, our sport director, and um, he might do the same with Newcastle United. You just never know him because he's really, really good and he knows exactly who to go for. Yeah. But it, and it's always a gamble. Isn't it? It's always a gamble. They've, uh, and and you, you have to accept that someone you think is going to be a big success, it, it may not happen. But, you know, Brighton are giving anyone, everyone a lesson in how to play the game. And I think it's, in re it's, but it's really, if you're going to buy in straight from South America, it's really important to know that you are buying a human being and not just a footballer. 
because almost certainly they'll come in not speaking English or speaking yeah. very, very little English. Mm-hmm. Almost certainly they'll come in feeling a little bit, you've got to make them at home. You've got to make them feel at home. You've got to do the work off the field with the human being in order to get the best out of the player on the field. Now, that, that's happened with Brighton, not overnight. Brighton have done, I think, a lot of thinking in how to do that. So mm-hmm. uh, Newcastle, if Newcastle are starting with scratch for that, it would be good advice for them to sit down with people who've brought in South American players and work out the best way to to, to deal with that that fella off the field as well as on it. Yeah, I could not just I could, I have to agree with you there, Tim. You know, again, sort of thing. You're absolutely right there. I have to go along with that as well. Um, I've got a question here as well. Um, why is that youngsters in South America cannot sign for Premier League clubs till they're 18 years of age? It's that's wherever they go. That that's a FIFA restriction. Um, to stop really kind of child trafficking, child smuggling, just to yeah. protect the young man a little bit. You can buy them before they're eighteen, but you can't if you can't get them over until until they're eighteen. The deal here, which I think has been a has changed the market, is Vinicius Junior, who Real Madrid they paid forty million for him at the mm-hmm. age of sixteen when he hadn't played a, a senior game, and it just looked like madness. They had to wait until he was eighteen to take him over. But you look at what what's happened now. And that 40 million is an absolute bargain because mm. that's really, really come off. That's changed the market. That means that the European clubs now they're looking to, to get them as young as possible. And if the players reach 22, 23 and he hasn't moved from South America, his chances of a move, once he hits 23, those chances really go down. Uh, he can still get a move maybe to a to a lesser league, but to one of the big clubs in a major league, it's unlike it's unlikely to to uh, to, to happen. Um, so just to protect the the young man, because it is a young man. And think of the changes that that we go through when we're around that age. Yeah. You know, 18. You're going through a lot of changes. Think about doing that in a different culture where you don't speak the language. Going through those changes of of boy to adolescent to man. To do that in in a, in a different in a different in a foreign country that that could that could be really damaging. I think that can be really dangerous. So it's just there to protect young players, and I think I think that's quite right. You know, let them let them grow up where they are until they're eighteen, and only bring them across afterwards. Absolutely, because you don't want to bring them in when they're sixteen, seventeen in the Premier League, and it's going to be a culture shock for them because it's a different type of football as well. You know, the Hurley and Burley at the rough and tumble of the Premier League, and. It's going to be a shock for them, Tim, if they come at that age. Well, it, it's a shock at uh, uh, um, almost any age, positive and negative. You know, I've spoken to to players who've, who've, who've done it, and uh, I'm, they the atmosphere in the stadiums, they just love the atmosphere in the Premier League stadiums and the sense of importance going, going around every game. They love that. They love the fact that they're not bothered so much when they're out having a, having a meal in a restaurant. You know, that, that, that's easier to do than it is in, in South America, especially if the team's just lost. Because, uh, you know, then th- th- there can be real problems. So there's lots of things that they really love about it. But come over too early when they can't speak the language, they can just be lost. And also, if they've grown up as a kind of wonder kid, and then suddenly they're just one extra player in a big squad, mm. and they don't feel wanted that can really shrink them. It can really shrink them up. So it, it's, you know, football is a game of human relations and you, you, you've got to understand the human being in order to get the best out of the player. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Got a Newcastle question for you as well and a lot of people will be interested as well. What are your thoughts on current crop of South American players? Bruno, Shaw Linton, that's how you pronounce it, Shaw Linton. And of course, uh, Miggy Amiron. Yeah, let's. Uh, which one do you want to go first? We we'll go first. We're going to go with Bruno G. Yeah, Bruno Gimaraes. Um, I, I suspect I might disagree with a few Newcastle fans here because I yeah. like him. I like him a lot, but I haven't fallen in love with him yet. Uh, he, when he was coming up, and he made his name with a with a club in the in the south of Brazil called Atlético Paranaense. I thought he was underrated. Uh, as a, as a box to box midfielder with real strength of personality, I remember one of the first times I saw him. It was a big cup game, and it went to penalties. And who stepped up to take the last decisive penalty? Young Bruno Guimarães. And I thought then, credit to you. You know, if it was me, I'd be hiding. You know, I'd be hiding behind the goalkeeper. You know, no one's seen me. I ain't taking a penalty. He stepped up. 
So I really liked him and I thought he was underrated. But then suddenly I think from being underrated, he became overrated because while I like him a lot, I'm I'm still not sure about him at the very, very top level. I still have my doubts. Is is he a little bit too one-paced? Is he a little bit too one-footed, a little bit too dependent on, on, on the right foot? Uh, so I, I think he's he's been a really important player to get Newcastle where they are now. Mm-hmm. As they develop, is he still going to be as important? I don't know. I, I would love to see what what your audience, what Newcastle fans think about it. But for me... He's very good, but I think just a little bit short of, of real world class. Yeah. But so, other opinions, other opinions are entirely possible. And I, I would love people to to come up and disagree with me. Yeah, everyone's got an opinion, Tim. Simple as that. They don't have to um, agree with everybody. But if you give marks out of ten for Bruno G, how many marks out of ten would you give him? In your opinion? Uh, can I go, can I go for seven and a half? Yeah, that's fine. Seven and a half is fine. Seven and you. a half with a lot of potential to go up. Fantastic. Thank, no problems at all. And Joel Linton, when he first came yeah. to Newcastle United, he had a tough, tough time really? under Steve yeah. Bruce. And then when Eddie Howe came in, he made him an absolute beast, Tim. Honestly, this guy comes in. I thought to myself, who's this guy? And I thought, to him, he's totally changed. He has changed a lot, Tim. Mm-hmm. And everyone loves him at Newcastle United. It's a, it's a lovely story, that. It really is. I really like it. First of all, we're going to get his name right. Start with Joel. Don't start with Joe. Start with Joel, and then it falls into place. Joel Linton. Joel Linton. It's, yeah, it's not Joe Linton. It's Joel Linton. But I think, you know, I'm sure he answers to, to, to Joe Linton without any problems. Um, I, I saw him. He didn't play very long in Brazil. He played for a, a, a team from the Northeast called Spoachi. And I remember him coming off, off the bench in a game. And playing up front because he was a striker at the time and thinking, wow, I like that. Two feet, two feet. Brazilian football produces a lot of one-footed players. He, he, he's, he's got, but on the first time I thought, is he left-footed? He's not. He's got, he's got them both. And I liked it. And it didn't surprise me at all when he was a success in Germany. And I thought he'd do all right at Newcastle. And when he was playing up front under Steve Bruce, there was one game I saw when he was fantastic, which was obviously away at my club, away at Tottenham, when he scored the only goal of the game. And he, he just, he, he ran the attacking line really, really well. So what went wrong for him? I suspect more than anything else, it's a confidence thing. And he was playing in a team that weren't getting high up the field often enough, weren't giving him, weren't giving him enough chances. And he kind of shriveled up. And he, he football is a game where you need enormous moral courage to want the ball. The easiest thing to do on a football field, there's lots of people there. There's 22 players on this reduced space. Just go and stand behind someone in your marks and you won't get the ball. You know, it's easy to do. I used to do it when I played all the time, you know. Hmm. Um, and I, I think there was, there was a lot of that to him and the need to justify the uh, the, the transfer fee. And I think it all it all got, got on top of him. Uh, and maybe maybe he wasn't handled particularly well at, at, at that point. But I think it's it's enormously to the credit of Eddie Howe. He had a look at this player and thought, no, look, this player really has 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 got things here that we can work with. And on the, the uh, you're right, on the, he's a beast. On the, 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 the physical capacity that this fella has to work uh, and the transition to a, to be a, a midfielder has been entirely successful. And I think maybe it took a, a little bit of pressure off him because his his um, performance wasn't going to be judged anymore purely and simply on how many goals he scored or how many goals he set up. You know, it was going to be judged by well, what he's doing over a wider range of the pitch. And I think that that took some of the pressure, uh, pressure off him and he's been flying ever since. Uh, big season for him now coming up, isn't it? Because he is no more promise. He's now reality. And that means that performances are not an, an, an unexpected bonus. They're now expected. So let's see how, how he deals with, with a position that he's, that by his own hard work that he's created for himself. Mm-hmm. We're now looking for him and saying, go on, 
go on, really make a difference in that game. But I think he's, he's up to it. I would, I would hate to face him. I know, them, them, he is. He is a beast with skill. And he's got some vision around him. And, and uh, I, I think there's... I'm, I'm really glad that it's, that it's worked out for him. And I'm really glad that the Newcastle fans stuck with him through, through the bad times. Uh, and, and so now you can all enjoy the good times together. Fantastic. Beautiful words, Tim. Fantastic. And every single Newcastle fans would love that as well. Um, and Miggy Almiron, I mean, he's had it tough for a couple of years, yes, I can't lie. Yes. And he hasn't scored for a long, long time. And eventually did. And now, last season, it was his best season ever. In my book, 11 goals last season. Started well, drew it a little bit, and came up to his own. Now, you've got Fox in the chat, right? Things I'm going to go at him. Which I'm not having a go at Miggy. I love Miggy. He's a big Miggy Amron fan. And what's it take on Miggy? Yeah, so am I. So am I. Uh, um, just the pace. The pace in the left foot. And I, I watched him win the title in Argentina with, with Lanús. And then the unorthodox move. You know, going to, to you know, the United States. Going to, to Major League Soccer. Uh, and uh, him going to Newcastle, I think, was a, was a really, really big move for Major League Soccer. Because if this works out, then that becomes that becomes a route for young South American players. You know, they can go to to, to the, the States first and from the States they can they can move on to Europe. If it doesn't work, then you end up thinking, well maybe that time he spent in, in, in the States wasn't good for him. Maybe he, he he didn't move forward. He was treading water then and it would have been better had he just gone straight to Europe. Yeah. But it has come good, hasn't he? Uh, yes. And because if, if you're going to have two virtues on a football field, electric pace and a left foot are fairly high high up the list, I would have thought. Um, I, I don't know how, why it took so long to bring those, to un, unlock those virtues out. Because he was a player, so I, would, I expected him to do better earlier mm-hmm. with, uh, um, with when, when Newcastle were forced to play a more conservative game. You know, before before the, all the money come in, I thought that he would do better on the count. You know, when they were playing on the counter attack, I thought he'd be lethal launching mm-hmm. the counter attack. But it didn't work. It didn't really work for him. He obviously needed, and he he I think benefited from the acquisition of Bruno Guimaraes, because then with Newcastle having more control of the ball in the centre of the field, it was easier to bring him into the game higher higher up the pitch. Uh, and it, uh, just like with 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 Joe Ellington, I knew lot are just fantastic supporters. You know, you, you are you are fantastic supporters. Uh, and and that that helps so much. I mean, the the northeast. This isn't Newcastle. This is Middlesbrough. But when Juninho went there, you know, in in '95, and I've spoken to him about it, and he, you know, people were telling him how well, the English are all so cold, uh, which may well be true of where I come from. But you know, he goes up to the northeast, and he plays in a team that gets relegated and loses two cup finals. And in Brazil, they'd be trying to burn down his house. In, in the northeast, they just loved him. They just loved him, and and. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I think you and, and the support base has been really important to helping these players get past the, the, the difficult times. In, in another club, they'd have been burnt. And Joelinton and, 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 and Almiron would have been burnt. Hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, we got nothing here. Get rid of them, you know. But you've stuck with them and you're reaping the benefits. So credit to them and credit to you as well. Thank you for that as well. Um, a few more questions before we go into the chat as well. And um, next question I'm going to ask you, Tim, as well, is do you think the presence and success of these players have raised the profile of Newcastle United in South America? No doubt about it. I mean, the, the Premier League is really big over here. Uh, it isn't Real Madrid and Barcelona. You know, it's, it's hard for a South American player where, uh, to, to say no when Real Madrid and Barcelona come come knocking, you know, uh, you think how how happy and how good Bruno uh, uh, Felipe Coutinho was at Liverpool, and then Barcelona come along and he wrecks his own career going there, just because he couldn't say no, you know. So Real Madrid and Barcelona are, are on a level of glamour that, that that's untouchable. But but um, the Premier League, without doubt, that the Premier League is is. The, it's the league that all the TV executives want. So if you're doing well in, in the Premier League, then uh, your profile in South America is huge. So, no, it, it's a question that I did a podcast last week with with Brazilian Tottenham supporters. And they were saying, uh, is uh, 
is is there a danger of of Newcastle overtaking Tottenham as as a as a as, as a, a big six club? And I said, sorry, pal, I lament it, but they already have, you know. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's 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 the way it is. So yes, I mean, the, the profile of, of of Newcastle, and I expect keeping up this progress, I'll start to see more Newcastle shirts in the streets. You see some because it's the same colour as Botafogo, uh, famous club in Rio, who at the moment top of the Brazilian league. So it's the same colours. So sometimes you see Botafogo fans in in, in, in the black and white stripes. Um, but I, I expect with more progress from Newcastle and more Champions League stuff and all the rest of it, I, I expect I'll, I'll see more Newcastle shirts in the streets of Rio. Fantastic! You touched on Botafogo as well. They were top of the they were top of the table. Did their coach just move to Saudi? He did, yes. Uh, and they just brought in Bruno Lagi, who was uh, at Wolves for for a while. Yeah, top of the league. Uh, but Saudi came in and offered him four times as much money, so he, he couldn't say no. Fair enough. That's what the woman is. At the end of the day, I mean, I think that league is going to make the Premier League, in my opinion, look like poor pass as well when it comes to money as well. But it is what it is. It's here to stay. And one last question before we go to the chat. When talking about your club, Tottenham, you said a football team assists to represent that community and a certain approach to life, which involves a quest for glory. Wanted the team to play well, as in the long term, as often offers a richer glory. These are the inherent shared values between the club and fan base. I feel this could equally apply to Newcastle, in your opinion. Does the ownership of Newcastle understand those values? Probably not. Um, I, I don't think the ownership of Tottenham understand those values. They're in it for very different reasons from the ownership of, of, of Newcastle. Uh, and this is obviously a cause for concern. I, I, I hate these, these people actually being referred to as owners. I don't like it because I, I only see them as custodians because who has, who has built this tradition? They didn't build it. You did. You know, you the people of Tyneside, you know, of, of, of Newcastle, the people of the North East, you have built this tradition. And this tradition, those values, they belong to you. And probably the, one of the reasons for the, the success of the Premier League is the mixture of the new and the old. You know, the new money, the new blanket TV coverage and all the rest of it. Uh, but without, and this is, this is the thing that Saudi Arabia, the league will now face, because the Saudi Arabian League doesn't have the old. It doesn't have, the to, to anything like the same extent, the clubs don't represent the values of, of a community. Uh, and uh, when you think of Newcastle, I always think of a club that for years and years and years underachieved. But I also think of the region that historically produced the best, most technical, most skillful English players, you know, and Chrissy Waddle, Chrissy Waddle for crying out loud! What an unbelievable play. Gaza! Now you used you used to make them and sell them to us. Yeah, you know, uh, Peter Beardsley, you know, and beyond that, you know, and uh, Bobby Charlton is 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 from 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 close by. So many great skillful players from from the northeast. I remember years ago hearing the old Tottenham captain, it was Steve Perriman saying, you know what, if you want to inspire a kid to be good at football, well, it, it, this is years ago, before they were making them the, the incredible money that today's footballers make. Instead of like taking them around to a big house in a stockbroker belt, you know what I would do? I would take them to St. James's Park at three o'clock on a Saturday afternoon and say, that's what it's all about, you know. And that was Steve Perriman saying that. Uh, so th th those values... Your owners, I don't, I don't, I don't understand them, and I don't, I don't really, I'm, I'm not sure how important they are mm. to your owners. Right, and and yeah. it, it, it's sad to think that that train has left the station. That now the game is in control of 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 people who understand the price of everything and the value of nothing. But you lot still understand those values, and 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 as long as you are turning up in the crowd being the Newcastle that you've always been, then something good comes from that. Something good survives. You know, the, the game can prostitute itself, but the the beauty of of 
that communion between the team and the fans, that's not for sale. Whoever whoever has their name on the top of the, of, of the of the stationery at Newcastle, you know, it's all about the relationship between you and your team. And as long as that remains its purity, there'll be something worthwhile there. Brilliant, brilliant. Well spoken, Tim. Well said, well said. We've got another 10 minutes to go before Tim has got to move on. And that's all for the questions. You can go to the chat as well. Any questions for Tim, whether it's be transfer rumours, ask him any question, and he'll be on the button as well. And um, first of all, I've got one is Adrian Pickett. Hi to Adrian. If Tim was scouting for Newcastle, which player in South America would he be pushing for? There's two players being linked. The first one is Ariel Feliz. He plays for Sarrio Central and he is a young lad, 19 years old, banging in the goals, 11 goals this season. And he's been linked with Newcastle and a couple of others in the Premier League. Tim, what do you know about this guy, Feliz? Yeah, I saw, plen saw plenty of him um, for Argentina at under 20 level in, in the recent under 20 World Cup. I wouldn't. You might remember, you may well forget this, but Newcastle had an Argentine centre forward a few years uh, a few years ago called Ferreira. And you hardly ever saw him because you hardly ever, ever got a game. And uh, the, the word came out from the Newcastle coaching staff that Ferreira was the worst player they'd ever seen at the level. Now, that, that's there's a school of of Argent, Argentine centre forwards, number nine figures, who put the ball in the back of the net but don't do a great deal else. And if you don't give them a lot of chances, they're not going to do anything. I haven't seen enough from Vélez yet to think that he at the hot at the highest level that he can he can, he can beat the best defenders or contribute much to the game outside the penalty area. So I, I'm, I wouldn't. I, I'm, I'm not sure that that he's he's anything like the level that uh, that that Newcastle need now. So he, he not not for me. Not for me. I, I'd love to be wrong. I, I'd I really love getting proved wrong when players turn out to be better than than than, than uh, I think in the in, in, insignificance of my opinion. Uh, when they prove out, prove to be better than I think they're going to be. But from what I've seen from Vélez so far, he's a he's a run of the mill centre forward at the top level, and I, I can't see him tipping the balance. Fair enough. Um, that's um, that's one we're going to avoid then at the minute in time. Um, question from George: What are your thoughts on the new FA ruling on one in technical areas? When I heard about that today, I'm thinking, I think the Premier League's going first as well because when you get Eddie Howe and Jason Tindall, in the technical area, that does it all the time. Now the Premier League's got to stop it. Yeah, I don't know what what this one is. I haven't seen this. I've been busy writing all day. So what what is the new ruling? Well, basically, it is right that um, you can only have one manager in the technical area. If you have two in there and the referee spots you, one is going to get booked, which is things an absolute right. disgrace. It really is. Yeah, if you're a manager and assistant manager, then you should be together. You're working together. Simple as that. Now the, the Premier League, I'm sure. They're doing this just to rub it in first, you know what I mean? And I could be wrong. And um, also, there's a couple of new rules where if you run to the referee, apart from your captain, you're going to get booked for that as well. Yeah, that one I'm in favour of. I think there's, there's too yeah. much pressure put on referees. The, the technical area, for me, obviously the, the coach should be allowed to talk to his to his assistant coach. Um where I think there is room for change is that the coach, the head coach, or Eddie Howe with, with Newcastle, uh, he should be responsible for the behaviour of everyone there. So if if something, if 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 there's someone yelling at the, at the fourth official or, or doing something like that, then Eddie Howe gets a yellow. He's yeah. responsible for everything that happens in, in that technical area. Because at the moment, the fact that there are there are so many people there means that you can share it, you can do a relay. Right, first it's him who'll have a go at the referee, then it's him and then it's him. No, Eddie Howe has to be responsible for, any, for any, anything that happens. And I think that change would be enough to improve behaviour. Yeah, I have to agree there as well. Just got more questions as well. I've got one from Foxy. He yeah. is the South Mega expert on my channel as well. So yeah. big up to Foxy. Why has no one took Andrea from Fuminese? I'll come yeah. on to him and Luciano Rodriguez and Fabrizio Diaz from newly Uruguayan champions Liverpool. Can't imagine massively expensive. I mean, Andrea's yeah. impressive. Yeah, he is. He really is. I mean, of, of Brazil's current crop of central midfielders, uh, Andrea is, uh, I think, 
the best. And he, he got quite close to, to the World Cup squad. He has to take a lot of responsibility because his side, they're very, very front-loaded. He has to have space running back. Uh, he's got a lot of space to cover there running back. And quite often during the games, he'll, he'll, he'll play centre-back. So that's um, uh, that, that, that's something which... I, I, he's a player. I'm surprised he hasn't gone yet. And he hasn't gone yet because he doesn't want to go. Uh, and our Fluminense aren't going to be able to... They're not going to be able to keep him in, until uh, beyond the next transfer window, I wouldn't have thought. The two Uruguayans, Fabricio Diaz is a, is a central midfielder with a lovely range of passing. Physically, he might struggle a little bit. That, that, that's my problem with him. But his range of passing is, is gorgeous. And Luciano Rodriguez is, a, is, a, is like a bull. He's a hard-running striker. He can play off the main. He can play right up front, but he, he can play off the striker. He's got two feet. Uh, he, he's, he's been the sensation of the year in, in with the Euroways under-20 side. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm surprised that he hasn't, he hasn't moved on. With Andre, there'll be lots of competition. Probably with all yeah. of these, that there'll be there'll be lots of competition. But I agree with Foxy. I'm I'm, I'm surprised that uh, that no one has come in big money with, with with them yet. Yeah, fantastic. And one last question as well. I'm um, Alan Little. Sorry about Alan as well. Um, Tim, who are the young top strikers and centre backs in South America? The best centre back, I think, is uh, another one from that Uruguayan under twenty side, Sebastian Bosselli who is class personified. Looks like he might be leaving Uruguay and joining River Plate in Argentina. Um, but I, I think he, I mean, he was just so unruffled um, that I, I think he, he could he could aim higher than that already. I think I thought he was he was absolutely terrific. Striker, there's a there's a, a good one at, at Santos in Brazil called Marcos Leonardo, who is uh, quite stocky little goal poacher, um, quick in inside the penalty area. Uh, and and Santos, I think need they would need to sell. Um, they really wouldn't want to sell him because they might go down if if if, uh, if 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 they lose him. But a big money move and, and Marcus Leonardo, I think, will, will move on as well. Um, so there are some names, but Newcastle are now in, in a position where you probably want in the really big names, aren't you? Why aren't you bringing in Mbappe? Yes. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> on, a, on a five-year contract as well. Pay no money to PSG. Ask him what they want. Bring him to Tyneside. We'll love him. Get the black and white shirt on. And we will do him. We will do kill him. <laughs> <laughs> and definitely the last question. One more question as well from JK. Um, well, it's to him. And I'll make it quick. Question with Tim. What do you think Newcastle need to do to beat the top six to win the Premier League and other cup competitions? Well, I'd, I'd imagine that the, the immediate task is to consolidate yourself in the top and to consolidate yourself in the in the Champions League. Uh, I think that that that's that's the task now. Um, I'm going to ping this one over to you. Okay. Do you think Newcastle are capable of doing that? Do you think that because the fixture list gets harder, you become a victim of your own success? You're in the Champions League now, you yeah. know. So you've 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 got to do well enough in the Premier League to qualify for the Champions League the next year. Do you think where Newcastle are now, they can sustain what they did last year, only with a, with a more difficult fixture list? I think we definitely need a couple more players, Tim, in my opinion. We need a left-back. We definitely need a left-back. No disrespect to Dan Byrne. I think he's terrific, but we need a specialised left-back. We need a centre-back with pace, because you look at the back four, we haven't got any pace whatsoever. They defend well, no pace whatsoever. The midfield... It's fine. I still feel you need another midfield general in the midfield just to yeah. mop things up as well. What we need, we need a decent striker. We need a decent number nine. Callum Wilson's done a good job, but he's 31 years old. Yeah, he's not getting any younger. Isak, I love him. He can play wide as well. I still think we need an out-and-out striker. Someone's going to make a difference. Someone's going to get me 20 goals a season. And if they get us 20 plus goals a season, Tim, and defend properly, Nick Pope was fantastic. Get a striker in. And then I think in two, three, four years' time, the title could become Roman St. James. It's his first time since 1927. I'll look out for that. The thing that interested me most there was a the lack of defensive pace. Because obviously, as Newcastle have to play higher up the field, obviously that, that, that becomes more and more of an issue, doesn't it? So, yeah, uh, yeah I'm, I'm going to be looking out for that. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So thanks for that. You've 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 taught me something about Newcastle and, and their year ahead. 
Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And Foxy, last one before I let you go in those quarters and nine. How do Scolari and Luxembourg keeps getting jobs? Can you believe that? Yeah, I mean, Scolari is uh, he's just taken over this new job. He said he wasn't going to coach anymore. He's just taking this new job and he's he's eight games without a win. So uh, he's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's struggling. He's struggling. They've got a big uh, champ- South America's Champions League ma- match coming up this week. Uh, and if they got knocked out of that, I think I think that that might be the end of him. Um, they keep getting jobs because Brazilian coaches get sacked all the time. Uh, no one lasts very long in in any job, so there's always a job opportunity coming up. And, and sooner or later, the call. All right, all right, we'll bring him back. We'll, we know he's a safe pair of hands. So, uh, but it's it's a problem actually. Brazilian football isn't producing coaches. You look at Argentine football; lots of former players go into coaching. Yeah. In fact, one who was with you, he didn't come off. Bacerdas. Yes. Uh, he, he, he didn't come off. I, I think he, he was a good player in a good team yeah. rather than a player who was going to set the, pre, the, the Premier League alight when he came over from, from Vélez. Uh, and he had a little go at coaching. And then he went into, into kind of club general management um, kind of thing. Uh, not enough former Brazilian players do it. Uh, it's because three losses and you're out. So, you know, Brazil is having a problem producing coaches. That's why so many of the coaches now, in the, in Bra- more than half the coaches in the Brazilian first division are now foreign. Uh, and so if you look, at, you know, you sack your coach and you're looking around, all right, these old, they're, they're, they're a safe pair of hands. We'll, we'll bring them back. So they get another chance. But I think that their chances are running out now. There's not long to go. Exactly, exactly. I'll tell you what, I've asked at YouTube and I've been getting a coach in Brazil, in Brazil, even though the weather's beautiful as well. <laughs> Tim, listen, tell us on about, man. I know you've got other things to do, but yeah. so before I let you go, I'm going to go out for the show. Did you enjoy coming on my show tonight? Did you enjoy it? I loved it. Yeah, I, I loved it. And, and I learned something as well. And um, so that, that, was, that, that was great. So uh, thank you very much for having me. And in the words of, of US President Jimmy Carter, Away the lads. Oh, we the lads. And Tim, and thank you so much for coming on, mate. And um, you're an absolute legend. You take care. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Speak to you soon. You too. Cheers. Take care. Ta-ra.